Um, thank you for braving the rain. I guess there's been a bit of a delay on the food. It is yeah, coming, and it will magically appear. And please feel free to immediately go grab that. Don't wait to get in the um, But I appreciate the opportunity to present this to you guys. Uh, this is a project that I've been working on with Mark Mizrahi, right over there, my advisor. Um, and it's been changing quickly. We uh, workshopped it um, about a month ago, and uh, it's still evolving, and it will be, I really look forward to your feedback on where you think we should take it. Um, also, I should say that feel free to stop me and ask me for clarifications or, you know, provide feedback right away. You don't need to bite your tongue until the end. Um, just raise your hand and we can discuss it. Um, so, just a brief overview of what this is before uh, jump into the specifics of it. Um, it's an exploratory agent-based model. Uh, and what I mean by exploratory is that um, we've designed a nice social system, uh, written up the code, uh, and we're exploring what exactly the dynamics of it might be. Um, it's an attempt to do theory using computers um, and simulation. And we think it has some exciting directions, but we aren't quite ready to take that and say, you know, uh, we see this happening in reality, uh, this is empirically verified. Uh, right now, it's still generative and explorative for us. So what it is, is a population of agents, uh, and each agent has preferences um, for the state of affairs of the world. So we conceive of the world as uh, or at least the particular part of it that we're looking at is being issues um, that uh, back up a little bit. Um, so it's a population of agents. They each uh, have knowledge about the state of the world and a preferred uh, state for it to be in, their own preference. Um, and these are the issues. The states, the the state of affairs is all of the issues taken together. They also have the ability to evaluate others' positions um, and make certain actions based on their evaluation of those other positions. So that's the population of agents. The environment is primarily the state of affairs, uh, which we frequently call the global problem, um, sometimes call it the state of affairs. There's the second environmental piece, though, uh, which is a network of social ties. I have that in parentheses because, as I'll explain a little bit later, for our analytic strategy, uh, we don't introduce that network right away. We look at the sort of uh, state space first. And then, of course, there are dynamics in the model. So we give agents the opportunity to evaluate others' positions uh, and just to decide whether or not they want to support that other position. Uh, and then we are also uh, periodically taking a vote. So if a particular agent has support of half the population, for example, um, that, that proposed solution can be implemented as the new state of affairs. Uh, we adjust that, we create some error around it uh, to acknowledge that you know, no group is completely successful in transforming their environment to what they want it to be. Um, so that's why there's a certain amount of error that we build into that. The fundamental question we're really trying to get at is what can we say about the long-term dynamics of this relatively simple setup? Um, you know, what are the group's chances of transforming the environment to a position that they collectively agree upon? Um, and what might happen after that? We think this is an interesting question um, because there's strong feedback in this area. Once the group is able to determine what they want the environment to be, um, that transforms the process that's going on, the voting that's happening. Um, and that particular type of feedback, we want to understand what happens once the problem is more or less endogenized to the group. OK, um, so that's a broad overview of the model. I wanted to back up and give you a sense of why we are asking these questions. Um, and the real impetus for the project was, is uh, Mark's book, very recently published, um, where he looks at the decline of the corporate elite in America. Uh, it was a group that was 
has been very successful uh, in transforming its environment, but more recently, they have not been as, as successful. So they've been effective in transforming their environment at various points in history. We understand that as being a function of the cohesiveness of the group. Uh, and furthermore, we mark in a strong sense that that cohesiveness uh, is a consequence of constraints that they face. So if we're looking at this through time, um, there is a day and age when they were somewhat effective, somewhat cohesive, um, but uh, after the war, up into the 70s, the regulatory environment and the labor movements created strong constraints on the group of the corporate elite. So, large degree of constraint on them. That led to cohesiveness. They organized, uh, became a highly networked group, which led to them being relatively effective. The consequence of their being effective was that they were able to remove those constraints. They were able to coordinate as a group um, and remove that. So this is them, in some sense, endogenizing the environment that the group exists in. They're concerned about these issues, these constraints, and they go out and address them. The question, though, that we're really starting to look at, though, is what happens when we continue rolling the clock forward. So they remove some constraints. What happens to the cohesiveness? It seems to go down. Um, and this is a valid question to ask because uh, Arguably, there are lots of things that the group could need to address. Uh, constraints today, healthcare, for example, there would be good reason for the corporate elite to work together to come to a better solution uh, rather than bicker bickering. But that has not seemed to happen. So, unable to address these constraints, rolling back, we understand that as being them not being particularly effective. To understand why that's the case, we want to look at what happens here. The relationship between constraints and cohesiveness once they've endogenized the constraints. So, yeah, so uh, when the, the first instance of constraints, the 1970s, uh, or I, I don't know when it is, but the powerful, powerful organized labor. Yep. So that's not just a constraint, that's, a, uh, that's an opposition. And so why with only moderate efficacy were the industrial elite able to overcome this prominent constraint, as you call it, or you know, what is an opposition? With moderate efficacy? Yeah. Um, why do you say moderate? Well, we, so the size of the dot the size is the smaller than the size of the size of the dot is the efficacy dot is smaller than the constraint dot. Fair enough. Um, I guess we haven't really conceived of it as being. Would be what? You could make you could make the, the two dots on the top bigger than the average the 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 better better represent the description. Yeah. yeah. So uh, don't read too much into the dots. Read something into them, okay. into their size. Uh, we would argue though that they were very effective um, in defeating this constraint or opposition, as you call it. Um, there's some more particulars to the actual history of it. Lots of particulars, as Mark can tell you all about. Um, but this is the, you know, the question that really brought us to this problem. Again, this is an exploratory model. We want to back away from this to a certain degree. Um, we don't want to claim that we, you know, through this model, have figured out what exactly happens here. But this is what brought us to the problem. Um, and the, the. Who we're really drawing on to make sense of this uh, is George Zimmel, J.R. Zimmel, uh, particularly his rather famous book, Conflict. Um, he views conflict as sort of an essential element of social life and sets out to understand its effects on groups. Uh, so going back to this drawing, he's rather famously focused on this relationship here. So, Here's your constraint. Here is um, cohesiveness. And he points out that when there is an external threat, 
this can drive internal group cohesion. So external threat, internal cohesion. What's less clear, though, is what he has to say about this other relationship here. What happens when the group successfully alters its environment? Um, does no threat, the removal of it, lead to less cohesion? He actually says a few things on this. Um, he says that it's lost when there's no longer an opponent. Um, although he doesn't say much to explicate why that might actually be the case. Uh, on the other hand, it's not clear why group cohesion should decline after a threat is removed. Um, I've been calling this the bunny bundling hypothesis of group formation. Um, rabbits, uh, usually when they are introduced, they do not like each other. Uh, and if you happen to own rabbits and want to introduce them to each other, uh, it's good to simulate some sort of threat for them. So frequently people will put them on a washing machine with a towel and turn it on and the sort of vibrations uh, scare them and they will actually bond. This external threat creates a bond. And that's a lifelong bond. After that, you know, they could spend years apart, but they'll still recognize each other later and come back. Um, just a sort of fun example of external threat creating cohesion and then that having permanence. Um, <clears throat> so Zimmel, in some sense, agrees with this. Uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, he would argue that sometimes emotional excitement doesn't disappear, uh, even though there might not be a reason for it to exist. Um, and the reason why he's not actually contradicting himself when he says things like this is that he sees a pretty complex social world uh, in what's happening with these groups. And he's seeing lots of convergent and divergent trends. So sometimes you would see um, external threat driving internal cohesion, um, but the removal of it will also lead to divergent currents. He has some nice uh, work on it, but it's still not exactly clear what the mechanisms are that might, you know, show this ebb and flow of cohesion. Can you say what the social scientist would say to this question? Mm -hmm. It seems to me one as to why it declined when the threat is lessened. One is that there's a constant cost to each member of maintaining this cohesion. In other words, you have to be nice to these other people, for example. Yep. And that's costly. Okay. Um, and so if there's no reason to be it tends to drift away. Um, the other reason is that there are always other dimensions of conflict. So if, to take your example, when the unions become less significant as an external threat, then there might be issues about tariffs, and, and that would divide the importing industries from the exporting industries. And so there's always other dimensions of conflict which would destroy the cohesion if they're not going to be correlated with the previous one. Right, and I think that's what Zimmel is trying to say when he's talking about the Convergent and divergent trends in there. There might be one dimension, one issue that's really driving cohesion, um, and we don't see the di divergent trends behind it. So the once other idea, the other idea is you get a different cohesion. That is to say, instead of cohesion cohering horizontally, you might cohere vertically. Right, right. And so that's, that's a lot of what we want to explore, and why we also conceive of the global problem as being multifaceted, there being a variety of issues to address. Um, you had mentioned the costliness of maintaining relations. Uh, we have thought a little bit about that for later iterations of the model, um, but right now we're trying to re reduce the number of things that we've built into it. Yep. I was going to suggest something like a replacement effect. Like, you know, these aren't always the same people as you go. Like, people who are working in the 70s might not be even like, mostly the same people who are leading the corporate chairs in the 90s. Right. So, they wouldn't even have the same uh, social bonds that would have been built up in the centuries. Agreed. Um, so uh, the churn in the network is definitely something that could drive you know, the decline in cohesion when we look at the population. Yeah, because then what would the model react to? If they're, human, if they're humans, yes. If they're companies, IBM can change its employees and still remember how right. it got along with this, this yeah. Samsung. Yeah, so that churn is another thing that we've thought about. Um, we don't want to build that into the model yet because that seems like yeah. that would get us the result we want right yeah, away. Yeah. So, so if you're looking at 
corporate elite as it, it's monolithic in some ways. And I, I'm wondering, right, like, there are these corporate elites and then they, they face threats from outside. But I mean, I can very easily imagine, and I'm sure you guys are you know, just as sensitive, not more sensitive to this stuff um, than, than we are, uh, that, you know, what it is to be a corporate elite is a multifaceted thing. We're getting to Bob's point. And so it might be that the constraints that they're facing on one dimension have lessened, but on another dimension have increased. Right? So it might be the case that, like, corporate elite qua, you know, old men sitting in a, in a room with leather couches and cigars have, like, lessened constraints, but you have greater constraints coming from South Korean tech firms. So, like, now, like, technology elites will kind of cluster in a, in a way and break off. And so it's not that, like, it's not that the constraints have diminished, it's just that the constraints have shifted to different dimensions over time. And so why the modeling choice to kind of look at corporate elites as, like, one coherent group? Um, so I don't think that we think of them as necessarily being monolithic. Uh, as I'll show you in a second, um, we see them having a variety of positions on issues. And again, the issues, the global problem is multifaceted, um, meaning that there might be a group that sort of coalesces around one particular issue. Uh, it might be import taxes. Another might be more focused on labor. Um, so you, and we actually do see different groups form when we have this multidimensionality. Um, I agree that, you know, it's hard to treat everyone the same. Um, in that sense, and that there's a lot of heterogeneity that's missing. Uh, but right now, again, there's still the state of trying to have an exploratory model where we sort of understand the dynamics that ebbs and flows of cohesion. Um, well, I think so part some of the issue here is how much we want to get into the detail of the empirical and historical story and how we want to do the model. I think we want to try to justify the model on the basis of the historical story. Doing that, we deal with this presentation, we're opening ourselves up for the questions you're asking. That, what you're, what you're referring to, you know, is part of the story, because the captain is okay, they are facing like that, but we can do anything else. The government no longer has as much control of us. Now, corporate CEOs are facing pressures from Wall Street to introduce the face, and, and, uh, and there's a foreign competition organization. So I think, I mean, those are, those, they're really good questions to ask. I guess the question for us is whether, how much we want to complicate the story, the story of the model yeah. to correspond with what's happening in the world. I guess what, what I would offer is just uh, trying to, to make the, the pitch like as parsimonious as possible to like, like circumvent annoying rebuttals, like mom. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, things are more complicated, and yeah. to try to like tell some like pithy story about like right. here's a here's a bunch of corporate elites, and this is what they did, and and then like but then twenty years later they don't seem to be able to pull this off. Why is that the case? I have a you know I have a model that I give traction on that. Right. Um, but when when you when you start talking about like the corporate elite, it's it, there are many ways that you can think about modeling or, or um, parameterizing those, those issues. Yeah, it's something we've been struggling with. This project came out of the question of what happened to the corporate elite. Uh, we do want it to stand alone, and um, perhaps it was a mistake to introduce that particular story. I wanted to provide something that sort of gives you an empirical sense of what we might be talking about. There are of course, all sorts of things, Trust questions that are left unanswered. Um, but let me explain a little bit more about the model and see what you guys think of what exactly it is. Um, so there are two main uh, prior works that we sort of drew on for inspiration uh, in constructing this model. One is the garbage can model of organizational choice. Um, that's a very rich article and model. Um, the thing that we want to really point to that we took from that um, was the fact that solutions exist independent of the actual problem. And there's this stochastic process through which solutions become attached to problems. Um, 
we see it as both stochastic and social, as I will show you in a minute. Um, so it's that fact. Solutions floating around a problem, eventually a solution might be attached to that problem and solve it. The other paper uh, is a paper that Mark wrote with a student, Aladdin Potts, um, looking at the relationship between centrality in networks and power in networks. Uh, a very common sense um, conception of power would say that this agent here, right in the middle of this network, should be the most powerful. Uh, they you know, are closest to other people, um, and one would think of them as being power workers. That's not always the case when, uh, when it's you know, a socially rich decision-making process. It turns out that the structure of the network um, can really change what's going on there. So who is, in fact, the most powerful actor? So with that in mind, uh, do you remember oh, do you yep. in the previous like why it's called the garbage can model? Um, because uh, organizations have garbage cans full of solutions uh, and problems that can be paired together, uh, and they're sort of it's a rummaging process that they're going through. Um, is how I understand it. I haven't fully understood it. Uh, I think I should fly over this stuff. Um, obviously, we have a sociological audience in mind. Uh, but the reason why I was really interested in presenting it to this group um, is that there's sort of a statistical mechanics flavor to this problem. Uh, I say flavor because it's clear that it's not actually st statistical mechanics. Uh, and furthermore, um, I'm not especially knowledgeable in statistical mechanics. <coughs> I've uh, sort of had a good whiff of it, um, but it certainly seems to have that flavor, um, where we are trying to understand the group's likelihood of success given all of the possibilities of initial conditions. Uh, and sometimes we're, we're thinking about things like, uh, you know, if a certain solution is presented, does that leave enough energy in the system for repeated um, group action? So, I would be very interested in any thoughts that you guys might have on the statistical mechanics elements of this. Um, additionally, uh, looking at this with sort of a Bayesian eye, in the sense that uh, we're interested, you know, we know what happens earlier on in this run, so the group does become cohesive and is able to present a solution and implement it. Does that allow us to update what we know about the system and what we might expect? So those are two things that we're particularly interested in. Okay, so basic model components. Um, this is how we've started to think about the system, uh, sort of as an issue space. So an issue is just a dimension that ranges from 0 to 1. Uh, and we can have as many as we'd like. Most of our runs we've actually done with 3, uh, just because it's convenient. Um, but we picture them as you know, a j-dimensional space like this. So the issues are just the dimensions. The current state uh, is the, the global problem. So in this particular drawing, the state of affairs are pretty radical along these dimensions of issues. It's not in the center of the space. Then actors have their own preferred solutions. Uh, these are the actors distributed in the space. Um, where exactly they are corresponds to their preferred state, uh, their preferred solution, what they would like the environment to be. So they're distributed up through the space. Actors also have an urgency. Uh, and what that is is essentially the distance between, say, that agent right there to the problem. Um, we break it up by dimensions so that you know this agent has very low, sorry, the blue one right above the red dot has very low urgency because the state of affairs is just about what they'd like it to be, whereas these agents over here, um, they would really like to see the state of affairs transform. Wait, I'm sorry. Yep. The blue dots are solutions or problems? Those are agents 
uh, and where they are in the solution space, where they would like to see it be. Those are their preferred solutions. Okay, so if there's the, the reason why there would be a sense of urgency is because you would be a lone dot on a solution that's where nobody else wanted a solution. Um, no, if they were all clustered down here, they could all have the same urgency. It's a function of their distance to the actual state of affairs right now. So the corporate elite, um, you know, when the labor movement is strong, presumably the vast majority of the corporate elite want to see that change. So, oh, sorry. You know, they are clustered on one end of the issue, uh, whereas the current state of affairs might be on you know, quite a ways away from that. No, nope. uh, it's shared by the entire population. So, okay. So, given this setup in this issue space, uh, agents are allowed to evaluate others' positions and decide whether or not they would like to support them. Uh, I'll unpack this decision rule in just a minute. Uh, and then finally, there's a public vote. If there's a solution that has majority support, it's implemented with the error factor. Um, so our analytic strategy is to first look at the dynamics of this issue space, and then we will layer on the social network version of it. So this, in a sense, doesn't have any social processes in it. We aren't considering the network uh, of relations that these agents might have. So for the later, uh, or for the second stage of it, you know, we're taking this network and mapping it into this space, and you know, drawing the ties between the agents. And I'll explain a little bit in a minute what exactly uh, the effects of this network embeddedness is. Okay. So how a single decision is made by an agent. Uh, we just grab one um, uniform at random from the space, label them the voter. Then we grab another one uniform at random, label them the candidate. The voter is the one who gets to decide, the candidate is the one that they're evaluating. Um, then they make a comparison of their position uh, and urgency to the candidates. Candidate's solution is the same as the candidate's position in three dimensional space. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, so then the voter makes a decision uh, and takes action based on that score. Here it would be I will support it, that agent, that candidate's solution, or I won't. They might also remain in the Okay, so the actual calculation of this. Uh, just walk you through one of them. Uh, right here is an agent's preferred solution. That's where they are in that issue space. They also have uh, the sense of urgency or salience. Sense of salience at each dimension. Yes. So we, okay. rather than having a single okay. salience score, we break it up by dimensions. Um, this is the candidate then. Uh, and here is their preferred solution. And we plug these into this formula. So, for example, this is the preferred solution of the voter. This is the current state of affairs, and we use that to figure out what exactly their urgency is here. It's just the difference between the two, or the absolute value. Here's the candidate score. We plug all these in, and out pops this number, this pretty meaningless number. What that might mean in terms of guiding social action is pretty yeah, unclear at this point. I mean, so what is the satisfaction? The right. satisfaction. I'm not yeah, sure. I, I, I'm close to this candidate. Right. Care about. Right. So yeah. what we do know about this number is that you know if they had the exact same position, okay. um, this would be zero. But we don't really know the upper bound operator. Well, we can get there. We can get there. Um, so to make sense of what exactly that number might be, we've taken two approaches. Uh, 
the preferred one is an analytic approach to you know look at the cumulative joint distribution of of these here. Um, haven't actually succeeded in doing that math yet. Um, no, we know that it's possible. Yeah, that should be feasible. It's feasible. Um, it's feasible once summer is here. Uh, so in the meantime, what we've done is um, simulated it. Uh, taken the same parameters for the run that we're going to look at, uh, set the model up 10 times, let them make a bunch of decisions, and get this simulated distribution of, of what the scores are. The reason that this helps us is that then we can think about um, scores in terms of percentages of all possible scores. So, for example, here we have a score of uh, 0.375 for that hypothetical setup we had here. If we say that the lowest 50% of scores vote yes and the highest vote no, you know, we can draw this line here, this cut point, and see that 0.375 actually renders a decision oh, excuse me, of don't support the solution. Um, so this is coming along. We would strongly prefer the analytic solution and think that we'll get it. In the meantime, we've been using the simulated version. What's that? Okay. Um, so to before we actually run the models and show you what it is, uh, quickly define two measures that we've been looking at. Uh, the first is tension, which is the distance. Again, this is the issue space that we've been looking at. It's the distance between the problem and the centroid, which is the center of mass of all, me, all of these agents' preferred solutions. Um, so if you think of these as being equally weighted points in the space, the centroid is the first order measure of the dispersion of Intention is the distance between the two. So presumably, you know, if the problem's right here in the middle of the space, there won't be that much tension. It'll be hard to get the group to, to change the environment and establish the, you know, the state of affairs as being something else. Uh, we also look at the average vote, which is, uh, well, so voting proceeds by assigning either negative one if you oppose, uh, zero if it's undecided, or one for support. Uh, then we just sum that up and use that to construct the average vote. And that's summed up over the, all of the votes cast. So at the beginning of the run, people haven't voted. Um, and so it's over the number of votes cast. Okay. So now we can actually start to look at what a run looks like. Um, there's a bunch of stuff on here that you might not need or you don't need to know yet, uh, you can completely ignore this bottom channel. Uh, and these lines up here, you can also ignore all this them once we turn to the social version of it. Um, but what you have here, is that really even visible to you guys? Uh, there's a green line right here. Um, and that's roughly around negative 0.2. So zero is right here, right where that red line is. Uh, and that green line is the average vote. So in this particular run, uh, this is time zero. We run it out to time step uh, 15,000. And you're assuming that the voting rule is that this was better than the RAND, than the, the median, the vote for it. Uh, better than the median. The median of all scores. If, the current, if your current score is better than the median of all, I mean, that's what, the way you drew it on that one. It's the, the measure of the average vote or the voting rule? Well, this one, you have to take the voting rule. Yeah, the voting rule is majority wins. Well, how does an individual decide how to vote? That was the decision rule that, uh, going back a couple slides, this. No, no, but you have to transform that into a yes or no. Right. You transform that into a yes or no. Right. Um, and I think they can Right, so that's that's a parameter that we supply to the model. And you either fix it for all these runs. You fix it for all the runs, right? So, um, what we uh, what we treat as a parameter, so we will 
you know, vary it over the runs, but typically what we do is, uh, you know, the lowest 35% of votes vote yes, uh, the top 35% vote no, and then that middle 40 that you name. Four dollars per time? A very weird time? Um, oh, because you're saying that, you know, if we picked it here, if we're expecting 35% of the scores to be well, if you're telling me that the lowest 35% of the scores, oh, on that scale, so we do it a third or 35% of the points? So then, the... Did you just tell me how you stress what you're saying? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Where, the two issues, where it's being cut and how many points are on each side. Yes. And if it cuts, if there are equal numbers of points on each side of the cut, then it's... Then it should be balanced. Um, but that's the, so that's the analytic solution for, you know, this is why we didn't just sample from one of them, we sampled from ten. Uh, each time, how does the voter, the voter is one of those dots, you know, the voter in the run is one of those dots. Not, so, sorry. Uh, this is essentially a histogram. Yeah, right. Okay, of, so they, so, they, the, the, the so they is, fall somewhere along this. Is, a, is a, 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 a random point under the histogram. Right. Okay, so then how do you decide where to vote, given that you know that you're at uh, 24 or 1? That is a parameter that we have fixed for the run. All right. And you say that if you, and you have, uh, if your score is lower than that, you vote yes, otherwise you vote no? Um, we actually have a middle region where you vote. I don't so know. I'm on this side. Yes. Are you fixing those for a set of runs? Yes. Okay. Because that'll tell you that the average vote. Given well, given that distribution, that will right. specify the vote. So, because this is a larger sample, we have this nice distribution. But for any given run, uh, you know, the scores might be. It might turn out that, you know. 90% of them are in this space here. So this histogram is not for one particular run. It's for a whole ensemble. So when we throw the agents out into the space, uh, so there's variation from run to run what it might actually be. So okay. So yep. in expectation, if you voted if you vote, so let's say that the median is at 0.3 or something like that. In, in expectation, if uh, all of the votes would come out, uh, equal, like, would come out equal, uh, equally distributed uh, between the like, yay and nay, over, over all of the runs, for any particular run, you, like, your issue might win or my issue might win. Right. Right. But but overall, like if we do this ten thousand times, we're gonna come out even. Right. Because of the because of the voting pool. Correct. Um, and it's that sort of statistical mechanics of it that we want to understand and don't fully really understand yet. Uh, you know, how unique one one might be and how that might relate to the actual behavior later. So to unpack some of the behavior that we've actually seen with this setup. Um, okay, so this red line is zero, zero axis. Uh, and the green line here is the voting behavior. So the average vote right now for this particular run is roughly negative 0.2, which means that they won't ever come together enough to present a solution. Uh, it's just sort of a non-starter. That's because they're so fussy. You set the parameters to get those people to work on it most of the time. Um, well, I don't know that. So this particular group for this run is fussy. Uh, you can see here, uh, I should describe these lines here. This red line is the tension in the system. Uh, the blue line is the number of votes that were cast for support and the number that were cast in opposition. Um, and this particular group is pretty fussy. They, they aren't getting along. It's a non-starter. Yeah, so they don't change anything. Right, they don't change anything. Yep. So uh, the, the tension is basically using for the distance between the centroid and the prop of the, the state of affairs. Currently, yep. So that, that seems unusual that you wouldn't, if there were a high tension, you would... You would expect that they would be able to 
or the yeah, support each other. Not, not even necessarily. So you're saying that nobody's going to vote for a proposal they don't really like. So could that be to any sort of proposal? Any given kind of proposal won't get a majority. Yeah, okay. So that can be explained in sort of like a, a, like a, a step, they're very spread out, even though they're on average over here. There's, there's not a whole lot of. Yeah. Choices. So one of the things that we've observed is that when tension is very high, they aren't able to you know, become cohesive enough to actually present a solution and change the environment and get something that's more favorable. Yeah, but that's only because you, you scatter them at random. Right. If, like you said, if they're clustered somewhere with high tension, they yep. would agree on any proposal in that Yes. And we've done those runs. Uh, so this is one behavior, a fairly common behavior, that things don't start. Uh, and here you see that they're in opposition. Here's another one. Uh, this time it turns out the vote is actually positive. Uh, tension is right here at 0.45 roughly, right next to the number of support votes cast. Um, so here they actually have a fair amount of agreement, but they still aren't able to uh, become cohesive enough as a group to present a solution. Um, so again, failure of a slightly different flavor. Wait a second. We got a positive vote in this case. Yep. So I don't see why they wouldn't come up with uh, a solution as closer to the central. Uh, we, we don't understand that yet either. Uh, but but they don't. Are you what proportion of votes are positive? Uh, the the average vote is 0 0.2. That's a positive. Yeah, so it would appear that you know there are different groups where they're supporting each other, but there's no group that is able to become large enough to get a majority position and Wait, change the environment. Why not? I mean, if, if, if the average vote is 0.2, won't that, and then won't any given example of that change the status quo? A given example? Yeah, yeah, in other words, if, 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 if more voters are in favor than are against, that'll change the status quo to that new proposal, to that, to that uh, candidate, right? Um, but this is averaged over all possible positions. So it's not just one person's solution that is being evaluated. They're evaluating each other's solutions. So it might be that this group over here you know, are consistently evaluating each other positively. Each other's proposed solutions. Over here is another group uh, doing the same, but, you know, across groups, they aren't. And that's why... Yeah, you, know, you never introduce groups before. You only introduce one, one person at a time, right? Yep. At random. Yep. When does the vote take place? After uh, everybody's after had a chance to... It's, it it happens vote. every turn. So uh, if a agent goes out and evaluates a candidate. Um, they take their action, support, undecided, oppose, and then we take a vote. Does, the, does every um, voter uh, evaluate the same candidate? No. Mm -hmm. oh, that's what's strange. So how do you decide? OK, so some people are voting yes because they got a candidate close to them. Other people are voting yes because they got a candidate close to them. Correct. Other people are voting no. Okay. So, but what sense does it make to say that if the majority are voting yes, you should do something? Because they're voting yes on different, everybody's voting yes on their own, uh, what they're looking at. Um, so the, the average vote is different than the actual uh, majority vote, okay. the mechanism for this implementing the solution. This is how they the candidate on the yeah. solution they're offering, really. Um, of the solutions they've evaluated. It's typically one, right? I mean, it's one. They, they're evaluating one at a time, but yeah. you know, it's as if everyone in the room had their own position, and for a while I talked to Pablo and decided that we can't We're not talking about it yet. Uh, there's, no, there's no communication between people yet. They're just, they're just offering a solution randomly to decide what it's based on. Everyone comes to the table with what they would like the, yeah. the state of affairs to be. Yeah. And then the process, the mechanism is we go around allowing them to evaluate each other. Each other. So how do you pick, let's say there's 20 people. Yep. So each of them looks at all of the 20 candidates that have been selected. Um, or each other picks one of the others and then decides. 
picks one at random. And they decide whether they prefer the solution that that guy was offered to the solution they were offered. And whether or not they would support it. Yeah. So it's not preferring one solution over the other. It's saying, oh, I kind of like your policies. I know, it's close enough. Yeah. So they look, they have their own solution, which they say is close enough or not. And then they look at somebody else's solution and say, well, that's close enough or not. Yep. So they get 20 votes on the one for yep. two? Okay. Yep. Okay. So people are making a, a support or not for each of the 20 things that have been offered. Yep. So they're really just the same. There's no relationship between the the solutions and the, and, the, and the voters, it's everybody sees all 20 solutions. All 20 voters see all 20 solutions. But they don't, so they don't actually necessarily get to see all 20. We're going around, so each time step, we yeah. grab one person and they yeah. get to evaluate someone else's solution. Yeah, so they're no more likely to see the 13th than their own. Uh, if you're if you voting one, if you're, more, you're just as likely to see the solution offered to the candidate to vote at 13 as the solution offered to yourself. Right. So that there are no real linkage between individuals and solutions. Um, yes, that sounds true. That changes once we layer on the social network. Right, I'm just trying to understand yep. this one. So, okay, so you basically have 20 voters and 20 different solutions. Each one of them votes for each of those solutions if it's close enough to where they are. Yeah, over time that would be the case, if they've right. evaluated all of the other ones. Yeah, okay. Yep. So it sounds like the the, uh, the average vote is more of like a measure of consensus or clustering than anything specific about like a particular uh, right. position. Exactly. See, then you could do this geographically, uh, and, uh, which is to say, let's 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 take away the urgency issue. Is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, given your parameters, you would be able to say that there is a circle around your position. Which you would prove of, and is any anything within that you would prove yep. of. And if the, and if the solutions are at random in, in the hypercube, yep. then the hypersphere around you is a proportion of the hypercube, and that's how much how, how, that's the uh, the frequency of your voting yes. Yep. That's the same for everybody, unless they're in the corner. You have to worry about that. Right. If boundary, but if, other than that, it means that you can directly calculate the average vote, which is the probability that you're close enough in this uniform space. So you don't yes. have to make an Asian-based model since they're not yet. changing the Not way. yet. I'm sure you will that's, later. But so, yeah. far, so, so that sounds great. And that's what we would like to do for this you know, non-social version before yeah. we layer the network on. Yeah. I mean, so everyone's, uh, the radius of everyone's hypersphere is dictated by that median score along the, the distribution of votes. So again, the, the, the size radi of the radius of the hypersphere yeah. is that is whatever yes. that yes. that median point is. It's dictated by that is that good distance. that's close enough to my ideal point such that I'll I'll enforce it because otherwise, you know, the baddies will win. And if it's outside, and everyone, and so everyone has the same tolerance. Yeah. All right. So what you get is you, you'll have a change in the state if uh, one of the solutions on attack uh, gets a majority vote, right? Yes. Okay. Which is the same as saying that a, a, a majority of those spheres overlap, and, and, so, and, then, and a point within that overlap has been correct selected. Yep. And so you could do that probabilistically too. Yep. Would love now, to do that. Now, what if there are two of the 20 solutions that are in this overlapping space? There are two of them in the majority vote. Um, that's where you know the stochastic element comes in. It depends who right. actually gets to evaluate. So whichever one gets. Oh, I see. One of them will come up first. Yep. It'll move to there. Yep. And then that'll redefine. Right. So, oh, no, wait a the, 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 the votes on solutions will have nothing to do with it, if I understand this right, with where the current state is. Uh, it does through the urgency. Um, because, you know, if it's way off in a corner in the space, the current state of affairs, um, you know, that will create urgency, which reduces the, the, um, the scores, uh, yeah. so that more people okay. will agree. The co so the coefficient of the algorithm is dictated by how far my ideal point is, that's where I am, the current state of the world. Okay. Right. And so, so my propensity to vote for the issue is, is a function of 
how like how important it is for me to change that. Yeah. To change the current state of the world. Right. And therefore, the spheres will the, the, the radius of, of some of the sphere will be a function of how far away the current state is. Correct. I'm just trying to get all this to the standard voting model. The standard voting model is a simple one. Because you're in this hyperspace, you've got a status quo, you've got voters, they make choices. It's, but the difference is that they typically, let's say, have only two candidates and they vote for the closer one. Right. For example. Right. And you've got a lot of alternatives. Right. So this is very early on. There's a state of affairs. So you don't know. satisfies the model. If it's good enough, you vote for it you know, without regard to any second possibility. Right, because you could support a variety of positions. Uh, eventually, there'll be someone and we'll bring it to a vote, and you say, oh, yeah, I support that one candidate. And when that happens, sometimes you get a majority. So, fairly early on in this run, uh, this was most likely a very faint line for you guys, uh, is when the group successfully transformed the environment. So, tension is right here. Uh, fairly moderate, a good amount of votes for, not too many against, um, and a solution is nominated and implemented. And the outcome of that is that the group actually gets along better now. So subsequent votes, a much larger or a larger percentage of it is for. The tension has come down, and the number of votes against has also come down. So the group. Why is this? I mean, you presumably move toward the, the center of that average. Yep. And so the status quo is probably. But new alternatives to that, you say, tend not to pass. Right? Um, you don't get a lot of. Any of the alternatives, yeah. Why, when they pass one of them, and therefore I understand they're more satisfied than average. Why is it making it less likely to find yet another one that's even better? And that, that, that whole loss of it, they're going to get a majority. That is not clear yet. Especially, Sometimes. especially if I didn't oh, because the, is that because when it's closer to where they are, the urgency is less? And that means that if the other parameters are fixed, they'll yes. tend not to vote for something unless it's really good. Right. So there's so less. That's, that's closer to the central, the closer to the centroid, the status quo becomes the less movement you're going to have. That's right. System. Yes, but not always. We don't know. Not always. Well, it's so, an average tendency, right? You're saying that. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's very so, Okay. So in this particular case, they are, you know, the average vote is up. They're in agreement. Um, they stay that way. In this particular run, they also present a solution, um, but it actually, the only real effect is that they start voting uh, a little bit more in opposition, this uptick right here in the opposition vote lines. So that's the we were expecting. So can you go back to the other case? Yeah. After they move, what's they happening? Vote for they support more solutions and vote against them less. And yet they never get a majority, so they never move, but they never move again. Yep. So it looks like there's a trend in the vote average that exists for several thousand ticks after the change. Yep. Why is that? Um, because the state of affairs have changed and we're continuing an evaluation process. So we're still grabbing agents at random and letting them evaluate another's position. Um, it could be the case that it's just going up because, you know, it's not until time step 2000 that, you know, all, how many agents is this? All 25 agents have evaluated all other 25 agents. So you show us two particular ones. Yep. And we have guesses of that which is more typical. Yep. Um, so yeah, this one, one solution. Actually, an uptick. Tension doesn't change at all, but an uptick in the amount of opposition. This run, they actually do this repeatedly. So tension is fairly high. 
Uh, they start out with a fair number of opposition votes. You can see that up here with the average vote being low. But this first solution that is presented has the desired effect. So it reduces the tension. Um, the percentage of votes of support goes up, opposition down. Uh, but they aren't satisfied yet. You can see how they sort of ratcheted down the tension all the way down to here, uh, and then remain there for the rest of the world. What's the mean distance between people and the next task force? I'm sorry? Tension is mean distance between the people and the next task force. It's not quite the mean distance. It's the distance between the centroid of the group, which is the center of mass of the group. Uh, this particular run, they actually have repeated solutions. So again, tension's high, uh, and they do some of the desired stuff. They are reducing it, um, voting more in support of each other, average vote is going up. But at some point, the solution is nominated that sort of breaks it. It shoots the tension way up again, uh, and you know, for the remainder of the run, they are unable to, to work together as a group to find something that's more amazing. They're moving away from the centroid, right? Yep. Well, they're they're moving toward it here. Yeah, yeah. But the last step. The last step. They're moving mm -hmm. substantially away from the centroid. Yep. And yet, it's still got a majority vote. Yep. Even though it was close to the centroid, so that the spheres of approval are small, it's a lot of two like some cliques. Oh, they all. The size of these twenty-five people are extremely advantaged. Well, I mean, they're distributed random in such a way that you have you end up with two sort of almost disparate groups on the opposite sides of the central. You can imagine them going together and then saying, "Oh, we like these guys. We disagree with strongly," and then they're. Uh, they're really I should yeah. point out that I don't wipe the slate clean for past evaluations at each time yeah. this is changed. If they have the chance to evaluate again, they could evaluate differently. So what you could do is look at those two things that look at the time, look at the what caused that vote. You know, which vote or should we go right to that step? So yeah. Who's voting for it? Who's voting against it? Right. Yeah. There's a ton to unpack in this. And right now we've still you know just sort of scratched the surface. So these are a couple of examples of the runs. Uh, and at this point, we've noticed a variety of regimes. So uh, in this non-social version, without the social network on it, the vast majority of them fail to find a solution. You know, it's a funny word, solution. What you're really saying is they don't find anything that they would prefer, that the majority would vote for. Right. And that's that to, I mean, the status quo is, is, a, is, a, is a solution, which you really in that sense, you really mean that they, they, can't, they don't improve on the status quo. Correct. It's called mm -hmm. a solution. Okay. An alternative. An alternative. Yeah. yeah. They don't find a better one. They don't find an improvement, an alternative improvement. And that might be just they started right in the central. It's not that they didn't have a solution, it's that they started with the solution. Um, but also, there are instances where the, the current state of affairs is not near the central. Right. And they, and they still can't find it better? Correct. That seems surprising. That would happen very often. But it happens, well, I'm not sure how it breaks down with the, the tension versus, you know, high tension but failure versus low it's tension. Like that. Definitely can. I haven't dug into the data yet, but a lot of failure. 15% uh, of runs do find a single solution, uh, but then, sorry. <laughs> They, they present an alternative, uh, but no subsequent uh, alternative is presented. They're either in deadlock or they're just sort of apathetic. Oh, they move votes. Right. Uh, around 4.5% are able to, again and again, uh, present alternatives and move that problem around the issue space. Uh, and sometimes they do this thing where they do it a couple times and then it breaks. They either go into deadlock or apathy. How do you really distinguish this from the thoughts on distribution, which is to say sometimes they have one, they move once, sometimes they move twice, sometimes they move three times, and um, yeah, and, 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 and that would yield some distribution like this, but that doesn't mean that they're different kinds of ones. It's you know, the, the model is you put a white belt in, 
and right. you wait two years, and sometimes the same light bulb will go off the last three years, sometimes you get six light bulbs a little two. But it's all one process and there's not really categories. Right. Uh, and it's sort of unfair to set these up. You know, one and done, it might be the case that it's just going to take a long time. We've truncated the run at some point. Yeah, sure. There might have been internal dynamics uh, that you know, haven't come to the surface in the, the time frame that we presented. Um, so yeah, these categories are sort of arbitrary, but sort of well, here's qualitative. What saying, what is the mean time of failure independent of the previous time of failure? Because the light bulb model, the next light bulb is just as likely to last a year as the previous one. And you're, you're suggesting that maybe that's not true here. Um, right, and that's why we wanted to do the sort of Bayesian analysis of, you know, if you get to a solution, what does that say about your subsequent chances of, sorry, if you get to, if you present an alternative, what are the subsequent chances of you, the group being able to do that again? Well, typically, I mean, the, the expectation, I would think,